College Place is a video library of noteworthy presentations, panel discussions, and lectures featuring guest speakers and faculty members taped at one of the Milwaukee Area Technical College's four southeastern Wisconsin campuses. These are produced by students in the college's associate's degree program in television video production in coordination with Milwaukee Public Television. Thank you again uh, for everyone for coming. Uh, welcome to the Community Conversation on Transit, a uh, vision for Metro Milwaukee. And it's sponsored by a group uh, new to you, MetroGo. MetroGo is a growing regional coalition of people that seek to connect, fuel the economy, and build vibrant, healthy communities of opportunity in Metro Milwaukee. Uh, you can follow what MetroGo is up to on Facebook. Just head to facebook.com slash MetroGo. Tonight, we'd like to uh, inform and inspire you and also get your feedback and incorporate that uh, with our friends at Sewer Pack, who are here from the Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission into their Vision 2050 transportation plan, uh, going beyond transit for all of transportation. Uh, they're working diligently on a plan for the entire region. And a lot of what we want to do tonight is get our feedback into that plan um, and really see what that feedback is. Uh, the program tonight, I'll be speaking for just a brief moment. I'm going to turn it over to five excellent speakers. Uh, they're all purposely chosen for their uh, knowledge in specific domains. So we're thankful to have them here, and I'll introduce them as their turns come up. Uh, after that, around 6 o'clock, or probably now just a little bit later, we'll be breaking out into these tables that you see everywhere. Uh, we have an excellent group of facilitators here to help uh, get your ideas. And then after about a half hour of that, uh, each table will present its ideas and feedback to the group. So uh, without further ado, let's jump into our first speaker, Bob Monnet, who is the partner and chief operating officer at the Mandel Group. He's responsible for coordinating and overseeing the activities of Mandel Group's development and construction operations and specializes in urban redevelopment, urban infill, and waterfront developments. I believe one of those waterfront developments, if you walk out the room, not right now, but then look out the window, it's right <laughs> across the river right there at the north end. So, Bob, yeah. is, this, is this on? It's on. <clears throat> OK, so first of all, this is we have five minutes. So this is timed. If I don't start talking, I'll, I'll be way off. So glad you're all here. Um, I wanted to open up tonight with this picture um, to talk about regional uh, transportation resources. This is a picture from Atlanta last week. Um, Atlanta, you remember, had a little snowstorm last week. And Atlanta is an auto-centric uh, a metropolitan area, and it reminds us, uh, it reminded me at least in preparation for tonight, of the need for diversity and repetition in our transportation resources. So one of the things I hope that we talk about tonight is how do we use multiple forms and multiple means of transportation to serve our region. Um, you know, Milwaukee, here's our billion dollar interchange uh, at the Marquette. Um, we've been an auto-centric community uh, for so many years. Um, all of you young millennials that are here tonight, Leslie and the rest of you guys, um, you know, it would be interesting to hear your perspective on it. Now this is your time to speak up as to what we build and how we build it. Um, in the past few years, you know, we've been on this epic building spree of, uh, of interstate highways and freeways and interchanges, um, as you've seen with all the orange barrels. And one of the things that we want to do tonight is prompt you to ask yourself and others, is this the right direction for us? Is that where we want all of our infrastructure money to go? And as we know, as you see in this picture from the Park East, uh, we've done a little bit of deconstruction as well, and sometimes that doesn't always go the way we wanted it to. So this picture, which first shed light on the Lackey and Joy building uh, years ago, um, some of that land is still not developed. So freeways help, and uh, sometimes taking them down doesn't necessarily yield the results. Um, we also want to talk about bus transit tonight. Bus, buses have been a huge part, really have been the only leg of our transit uh, uh, system, uh, the sole leg of our, of our transit for the last, I don't know how many years. Um, we've been taught uh, to believe that regional bus systems here have been efficient and have worked well, but we really want to know how you think buses should work. If you're in Europe, which I don't know if you can really see this picture, but you know, a lot of cities in Europe that are rail dependent have very robust bus systems as well because they know that rail doesn't work in and of itself. So these different levels of service and, and how the buses are set up, um, you know, you go, you, I haven't ridden on a bus here too often because quite frankly, 
Uh, they don't meet my needs, but they don't look like this either. The seating, uh, the facilities on them, how much money do we put into that and how much money do we put into the infrastructure of a bus system here? A bus system is not just buses, it's buses, it's drivers, it's, hard, it's that hardware, it's stations, it's infrastructure. Not everything has to look like this station in Seoul, but you, you, you know, there's software, there's applications for scheduling and routing and calendaring. Um, so buses want to become a big part of the mix here, I think, um, regardless of what happens with light rail, which is the most, uh, I was just talking to someone earlier, talk about a lightning rod topic in Milwaukee, it's light rail. So I'm actually hoping that there are people here for and against light rail. I'm hoping that there's a really lively discussion on it tonight. Um, and, uh, and I think that here's a picture from Portland. Uh, Portland has embraced rail. Um, and most cities that have embraced rail have had very healthy ridership. Um, my personal favorite uh, that I'd like to hear a lot of people talk about tonight, Kevin I'm sure is gonna make sure that that happens, is bicycle infrastructure. Um, there's a lot, of st a lot of information out lately about how bike infrastructure helps build the regional economy, helps build uh, the vitality of commerce on the streets where it's located. But given that this is a regional conversation tonight, you've gotta go a little bit beyond just bike sharing and bike lanes and things like that. There are some great recreational resources that are developing in, in terms of interurban uh, connectivity. And finally, with respect to the, the overall picture, Remember how these different systems work together. So be it automobile, light rail, bus, bicycling, whatever the mode of transportation, the, in, the, the uh, integration of them into one another and the redundancy that that creates is what will help us avoid the first picture, which was the picture of Atlanta. So tonight we're hoping to see a lively discussion. We're hoping to see lots of different uh, perspectives. We're hoping to see uh, 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 converging viewpoints as well as diverging viewpoints. Uh, we're hoping to see a lot of politeness at the table. Um, if you want to split your friends, just write a letter to the Journal Sentinel about light rail and you will just like split your entire friends base immediately, uh, but have respect for all the opinions so that we can get the collective image uh, and the collective perceptive pers uh, perspective down on paper. So that's it, five minutes. Carrie, that was it. I'm going to turn it over to who's ever next. Uh, next up is Carl Quindle. Uh, before I say anything else, Carl deserves a round of applause. He's one of the latest of the 40 under 40 recognition by the Business Journal. Um, but he's here not because of that, but the reason he got that, and that is he's an entrepreneur and executive specializing in real estate sales, operations, technology, negotiations, P&L management, and strategy. Uh, he does this through Axe Housing, uh, which he's been with since 2008, a nonprofit. That nonprofit has returned 360 foreclosed homes in the Milwaukee area to responsible occupancy, which is nothing to shake a stick at. So congratulations, Carl. I'm Carl Quindell. I'm the executive director of Axe Housing. Um, here for the visioning uh, of 2050 and the future transportation system of our region and city. Uh, I represent um, you know, a group that is focused on the inner city of Milwaukee. Um, for the last seven years, I've, I've worked at a place called Axe Housing, and we help inner city families reclaim uh, abandoned foreclosures in the inner city for owner occupancy. What, what I talked about today at the event is, uh, you know, one of the things is that we're, we live in one of the most unique um, real estate markets in the entire world. Uh, here it costs six to eight hundred dollars to rent and it's literally hundreds of dollars cheaper to own the exact same home or the home uh, right next door to you. And when you factor in uh, transportation that becomes kind of one of the the housing and transportation are the main drivers of a, of a, a family's uh, expenses and and when we have that kind of support in terms of the real estate market it's a huge opportunity and that's what we do. We try to partner with families. Um, one of the other things is that uh, you know, ultimately we need a bridge between what's happening in the inner city and the surrounding region. Um, and I mean that figuratively we need actual ways to get outside of the inner city. I, I live next door to you know a person, uh, who, a family with a child who had never seen the lakefront and we live you know literally a mile away from the lakefront uh, and you know two miles away from the lakefront and um, 
so you know just there's not a lot of access and so once you have a family that is is able to get some stability uh, through ownership um, in, in one of these types of real estate markets uh, you, you start to pick your head up and you start to demand access to, to more um, uh, whether it's the schools or the type of transportation and you know I talked a lot about uh, you know what some of those you know demands might look like you know, whether it's a walkable community uh, whether it's some of the amenities that folks have in other communities uh, when you can lift your head up for a moment um, you start to be able to actually see that you, you'd like more um, and housing and transportation become one of the first places you make those demands and, and we focus on housing but clearly the families we work with uh, there's not a lot of businesses in the inner city, and so they need ways to get to those businesses for jobs, and they're hardworking, but it's still, it still can be a big challenge. Well, ultimately, I think you know, we're, behind, we're behind a bit, and some of the other cities have figured this, this part out um, or a little bit ahead of us, or they invested in these type of infrastructure um, long ago, and they, they've, they've inherited that system, and we still have to kind of build it out. We're still very uh, car-centric here, so I, I, I'd hope that... Uh, although we're a very spread out city and, and, and uh, region in some ways that, that there can come up, we can come up with some, some good ideas about ways to uh, make better connections with, you know, so, so not only do we have kind of right now this inner city that I think is forgotten and, you know, uh, there's a lot of fear, I think, that comes out of people when they think of what's in the inner city, a very segregated city. Uh, I think transportation plays a big role in how, how we can connect what's happening in the inner city with the surrounding area and region. And I'm hopeful that what will come out of today is, is some, some big ideas and some solutions to, to fixing that. My name is Magda Peck, and I serve as the founding dean of the Joseph J. Zilber School of Public Health, which is at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. This is the first school of public health in the state of Wisconsin, and I came here to be able to connect health and transportation. What I told the group tonight, which is mostly made of people who work at the transportation sector, is to look at things through the lens of health and ask what is the impact of the choices that we make about transportation systems on the health and well-being and the vitality of the folks that live and work and worship and play in the city of Milwaukee and the region. The main deal is to think how we can ask a couple of questions around health impact. One of the questions we want to ask is, are the decisions that we're making about transportation fair? One part of that is when we look back historically about where our highways were built, they tended to be built in neighborhoods with the most vulnerable people. That's not always fair, and it took good working class, middle class people, and pulled them away from the neighborhoods where they grew up, where their grandparents grew up. So when we think about where we're going to design highways and throughways and bikeways, we should be thinking about who already lives there. A second question that we should be asking is, is it healthy for us to be able to take that form of transportation? Here's a good case. Buses put out some terribly toxic fumes. And we're concerned about people who live next to congested highways as well as are exposed to those fumes to give respiratory diseases and other problems for their life and livelihood. So we got to think about, is there a consequence to this transportation? Is it making us sick? A third thing I talked about tonight was the question of whether or not the way we use transportation now is just stressing us out. If I have to commute an hour, hour and a half, in something when there's not traffic might take a reasonable 17 minutes, I'm constantly stressed about being late, the quality of my life has gone down, the time I get to spend with my family, my children, my neighbors is gone. And that social capital is something we need to think about as a byproduct of our transportation choices. I also talked tonight about making it safe and asking, are what we're doing in our choices for transportation safe choices? Too often, we have folks that are um, hurt in injuries in automobile accidents. It's one of the leading causes of death. How do we create the conditions so that it's safer to take the transportation that we do? And if we're not in our own cars, but rather on public transportation, the risk goes down. Finally, we are one of the most obese states and regions in the whole country. If we don't do something 
about the obesity epidemic by getting us off our butts and getting ourselves moving, well then, we're going to be having chronic disease, heart disease, cancer, and all kinds of illnesses and a terrible quality of life, not only for us, but for our kids. Transportation and recreation are keys to getting us moving. If we can create bikeways and walkways and transit ways that get us physically active and healthy and make them beautiful and inviting, then we can do our part to combat the obesity epidemic. So I'm asking, what's the health impact of the transportation choices we make today that it will affect our kids and the next generation? Did a little search for some jobs that are out here in the market right now today, very live. One that was just posted by an employer of ours uh, located out in Watertown. They're looking for um, a low-level design engineer. We have a great engineering school here. They're looking for a year or two of service. Let's get somebody in here who can do that. Well, if you live downtown where young professionals want to be these days, right? Upper East Side, Lower East Side, uh, River West, Bayview, uh, the Third Ward, the Fifth Ward, we keep expanding. However, the jobs are far away. Now again, we're not talking about low-skill, no-skill manufacturing jobs, which we hear a lot about, but we also find that those jobs are being pushed out in other places. Point A is where my office is in the Third Ward. Point B, in Watertown, where this design engineer position with one, two years of experience is located, it would take me 49 minutes in my car to get there. So I take two hours of my day to commute to my job, back and forth. Is that really how I can balance my work, play life? How does that really make sense? Now, I did the same search, but doing it with public transportation, and it said, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> what I did find was that, <clears throat> excuse me, was that if I rode my bike, it would take me um, about five hours and 20 minutes. And if I walked, it would be a cool 15 hours and 34 minutes. <clears throat> So now we have to figure out, how does that happen? And if I'm a young professional design engineer who wants to be in the thick of things near the cultural assets that this city has to offer, <laughs> world-class museums, great restaurants, um, that get all the great recognition, I might want to take spend my evenings every night sitting next to the bronze fonts. I don't want to do that, and I don't want to have to live in Watertown to do that. Now, <clears throat> we have um, jobs in one of our great suburbs. So when we talk about transportation, how do we get people to jobs and where they want to be? My family has two cars because we're forced to do so. We would love to only have one, if at all, but it doesn't, our jobs don't allow us to do that. Um, and we live in the city. Now, our largest suburb, <laughs> our largest suburb um, is the third largest city in the nation, but it's also the second largest transportation center uh, in the country. It's a major transportation hub. Now, whatever our transportation looks like, we want to make sure that we can access uh, what's happening there. They have a metro system, obviously, that gets you there. It's very slow. If we have trains, I want them to go fast. Um, but we can link to the suburbs out there. So we need to do a few things. We need to think about talent attraction, business attraction, recruitment of professionals to keep them here, to bring them here, and businesses. We need to retain them here. We have to make a transportation system, uh, uh, an entertainment cultural system that they want to be in and stay in. But we have to rethink about how we do business, how we attract our, our workforce, how we keep our workforce, and how we grow it. That's what I got. <laughs> our uh, last speaker of the evening, before we turn it over to you to discuss amongst yourself, is Alex Runner. Uh, Alex, previous, yes, he's the biggest fan. Ben is in the first row. Uh, also his son. It's well played. Uh, Why do you think I brought him? Uh, Alex previously was the chief of staff for Common Council President Hines. He then took an internal communications role at Northwestern Mutual. Uh, I credit him with bringing the new office tower downtown. And facts uh, maybe a bit deceiving there. Uh, and most recently, Alex has joined Johnson Controls in another internal communications role. So, Alex Runner. All right, thanks. <clears throat> so yeah, my son Ben is in the front. Ben, how old are you now? Seven? Seven. seven. So when Ben was born seven years ago, first, people, first thing people would say to me is, oh, when are you moving out of the city? 
Uh, now, I grew up in Whitefish Bay, great upbringing, nothing against the suburbs, it was great, but we live in Sherman Park. We lived in Sherman Park for about 10 years, 48th and Meineke, great neighborhood, canopy of green trees, Ben walks to school at the Milwaukee French Immersion School. I take the number 57 bus every day from the Central City downtown. I took it when I worked in City Hall, I took it when I worked in Northwestern Mutual, I take it when I work at Johnson Controls. So we have a great life, don't you think, Ben? We have a vibrant life, we got a lot of opportunities, he's in Cub Scouts. We got a lot of great things that we're doing, and we don't want to move. And if you notice, there's this trend, demographics are shifting, but also what people want is shifting. So it was mostly older people who would say, when are you moving? When are you going to go back to Whitefish Bay? When are you going to move to Mequon? Uh, younger people, millennials, people who are Generation X, Y, like myself, they don't ask that question as much because they realize that the city offers something, whether you want to live with, in di a diverse neighborhood, you want to live in a walkable neighborhood, you want to have a quality of life where you can uh, interact, you don't, you're not so reliant on your car, you're not going crazy in the morning trying to pack your family up in the car and you're screaming at each other. There's a different peace, there's a different, uh, a different vibe or a different value living in the city. And it's not for everyone. I'm not saying everyone needs to live in the city. But if Ben had the opportunity to go to Richards Elementary School in Whitefish Bay, where I went, or French Immersion, we would choose French Immersion. It's, it's the best. If we had the opportunity to have two or three cars or have the bus, and my wife has a car, um, I would continue to take the bus. It's a quality of life issue. How do we switch off this? OK. So uh, you can see the demographics are shifting here. And you can see the Generation Y or Millennials, they still drive a lot, but they use public transit a lot more. They definitely like to walk. And it's interesting, you look back at the, the silent generation or the war generation, um, the baby boomers are getting older, they drive a lot. Baby boomers love to drive. And, but as, as the population of people is increasing, the number of people who are age 65 or older is gonna double by 2035. And here's a little, little interesting nugget. Did you know we didn't used to have really senior citizen homes? That, because people, as they got older, they would still continue to be independent. They could still walk to their corner grocery store, walk to the post office, or take a bus. Now, with everyone living out in Genesee and the subdivisions where you, are, you have to have a car, and houses are even designed around the car, the garage is the front thing, um, see, as people get older, they must live in a senior citizen home. They can't be independent as much. So it'll be interesting to see. But millennials, I think, are kind of leading the way back to a different quality of life. If we can switch the, and here, if you look here, the nation, am I supposed to be switching that? Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm not 40 under 40. I, uh, <laughs> so so uh, um, if you look here, transportation use is increasing. And I, 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 don't, I know that Carrie men mentioned this, but one of the big things that we're supposed to say, is, which is true, is that um, the population is expected to grow in southeastern Wisconsin by 330,000, or by 330,000 people by 2050. And so it's just a necessity. We're going to be able. We're going to have to use more public transportation. And that's what's happening, except in Milwaukee. In Milwaukee, public transportation use is decreasing, and our investment in public transportation is decreasing. We have bus routes cut. Thankfully, my 57 route hasn't been cut. But um, this national trend of more and more public tra transportation is just a necessity. It's just basic. I mean, I used to live in Japan, and in Japan, business people use tra public transportation. It's not a poverty thing. You know, and you can time your watch to the Shinkansen, the bullet train. It's a, it's a cool thing to take public transportation. And it's not a regional design, it's a state design. So you want to go up to Hokkaido, which is basically like the UP, you take public transportation. You want to go to Tokyo, you take public transportation. Rural people take public transportation. And that's the way Europe has gone. That's the way a lot of the United States is even going. That's the way we need to go. And Milwaukee's just, I don't know, stuck in the dark age or something. I don't want to offend 50% of my friends, but so. Um, yeah, so and here we look here. Uh, these are areas that are not served by transit. I think we're going to break out into groups and we're going to talk more about this. It's just uh, we have a problem. I write for the Journal Sentinel. I do a blog called Urban Center. Um, not as good as urbanwalkie.com, but it's still pretty good. I interviewed Judge Derek Mosley, who's a big mentor of mine, great guy. He said, he's from Chicago. He said, we understand the need to connect from Milwaukee to Chicago. We seem to get that. But he, he said, when it comes to connecting the city to the suburbs, we're clueless. It's the most basic thing to have a regional transportation authority or a regional transportation set. And we're going to talk more about this in these groups, and Bob mentioned it. You have industrial parks in New Berlin that need jobs. They need people. They need workers. They're begging for workers. We have people who need jobs. And you can't make the connections. You know, uh, Tim Sullivan, uh, Bucyrus, well, not Bucyrus anymore, I mean, he spent like a year going to church basements in my neighborhood in the central city trying to get people to come out to Bucyrus. 
He said it was like trying to get people to China. When, you, when you're trying to match up all the, the bus routes and their disconnections and you've got to wait on buses, and buses are not as reliable as rail, and people need to be at a job. So for whatever reason, we're not making these connections. We're not understanding that this is crucial to employment and it's crucial to, and crucial to our, our vibrancy as a region. Um, I know I'm probably over time. This is important that when we look at your median, your income, here we're just looking at housing. So the, these people are at, they're below a 30% median income in yellow there, that's housing. When you add housing and transportation, I think this has been mentioned, the cost goes up. So Ben's uncle works for PNH or Joy Global, and he lives out in Genesee. He spends a ton of money on gas, a ton of money on his SUV, and he can, because he's an executive, he can do that. But when you, when you not everyone can do that. Not everyone can, one minute, seriously? When, uh, not everyone can, can, can afford that, so the cost, you, you end up trapping people. Now, I want to live in the city, but people are forced to live in the city. Here we talk about how downtown mixed use is just much uh, smarter than having tons of parking lots, cost-effective, better in most every way. Now here, this maybe sounds strange, but I'm gonna quote C.S. Lewis. Anybody like C.S. Lewis? <laughs> Screw tape letters, mere Christianity, what line, which one wardrobe? You might say, Alex, what does this have to do with transit? It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Why do, what does that have to do with transit? In Milwaukee, we hang on to our mud pies. We hang on to our atrocious bus system, no offense to anyone, that doesn't value riders and doesn't value drivers. And we can't even imagine what is possible. This is what's possible. These are the people I've made friends with just in the last year. These are the views I've seen from my bus. This is the interaction. This isn't too great. This is how bad it is. But we, I mean, so we don't have, you go to almost any other city, you have heated bus shelters. You can look exactly when your bus is going to come. They don't have paper tickets. So we have great opportunities. Sometimes I think we can't even imagine what's possible. And I hope it gets better for Ben. I lied to you before. Uh, we have one more speaker before we break into small groups. Uh, and that's Eric Lind. He's a principal transportation planner uh, for SUREPEC, the Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. Uh, he's overseeing the Vision 2050 transportation plan. And without further ado, Eric Lind. Thanks. Is that all right? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me all right? All right. Uh, now, Jerry promised I could have one of his minutes. So if you would just add one more minute to my Sorry talk, I'll try to. Um, but I'm going to just talk briefly about the Vision 2050 process. Uh, this is a process to develop a new long-range uh, land use and transportation plan for the seven-county region. Um, a little bit about sewer pack, just very briefly. We are the official area-wide planning agency for the seven-county region. Um, we've been doing this for over 50 years, creating plans. This current plan that we're working on is actually the sixth generation. Um, we do advisory planning for not just highways and transit, but other, a lot of different other items as well. Um, so what is Vision 2050? Well, Vision 2050 is the process that we're using. It's a little bit different than past processes. Um, we're going to try to develop a shared long-range vision for land use and transportation in the seven-county region um, by asking, starting off by asking two main questions. How do you want your community in the region to develop, i.e. land use? And how do you want to be connected to the different places where you live, work, and play, i.e. transportation? Um, the end game is a new year 2050 regional land use and transportation plan, which we will hopefully get to by June of 2015. Um, way too much on this slide, but uh, this is just the five steps that we're going to take in getting to the, or four steps plus the final recommended plan and getting to that final recommended plan. The first one is, uh, is a visioning approach that we're taking. Visioning is a process we're using to, to try to develop, um, or to identify your preferences. Uh, we've got some uh, great speakers here that have talked about different um, ways, ways to develop land use and transportation in the future. We also want to hear from you and everyone else around the region. We've had some workshops so far. Um, we'll be having more as we go forward. We've also done some surveys trying to get people's preferences. Um, all, of, all of the efforts that we've done so far have led to the development of 15 draft guiding statements, we're calling them. Um, these are meant to be the basis for going forward. They're supposed to be simple, understandable statements that will be um, kind of provide the, the, the framework for developing the, the rest of the plan. Um, 
the, at each one of the tables, when you break out into small groups, you'll have a copy of those 15 guiding statements. And I think that's part of the exercise of the small groups. You can kind of give, our, give us your feedback on those statements. Um, hopefully, you can do that in the next week or so by Valentine's Day. We figured that was a fitting end for the, uh, the rating part. Um, and then we'll be looking over the next month or two to refine these and, and create a final set. Uh, the next step is, is looking at scenarios, scenario planning. Um, what we're looking to do is develop sketch land use and transportation scenarios. These are um, conceptual, broad. Uh, we're not going to be looking at specific land development patterns, specific transportation systems, but what if we had a, a transit-oriented development pattern and we had a fixed guideway system, um, rail and, or BRT system to serve that? Um, what would that look like? How would it differ from the current trends that we've, we've seen over the last couple decades? Um, we'll bring, that, bring those scenarios to the public, to you guys, uh, to review in May of this year. And hopefully we'll get your feedback and that will lead into the develop development of those more detailed alternative plans um, that will be from a re refined and narrowed set of scenarios that we're looking at. These alternative plans will have a specific land development pattern. They will have a specific transportation system associated with each one. Um, based on those guiding statements that we've uh, got around the tables here and that we've developed so far, we'll develop more detailed plan objectives and measurable, uh, what we're calling indicators, to, to use to evaluate the scenarios, compare the scenario, or evaluate and compare the alternative plans. Um, again, we'll have more public input later this year, and we'll actually do some polling. So you can all identify which alternative plan is your pre uh, preferred, and that will lead into the identification of a preliminary recommended land use and transportation plan. Um, now that may be the uh, preferred alternative, maybe there's one alternative that's just overwhelming, overwhelmingly preferred, or maybe we have to take some things from uh, several alternatives and, and combine them into the preliminary recommended plan. Um, <clears throat> Hopefully, what we, what we achieve by that state is a consensus plan for the future of the region. Um, we understand, we recognize that that's a difficult thing to come by, especially in, um, especially in southeastern Wisconsin, where you have a lot of different views from around the region. Um, what, but once we get to that point, we will again show the preliminary recommended plan to everyone, uh, get your feedback, and use that feedback to develop the final recommended plan. And there you go. June 2015 is when we're hoping to have that done. So I actually didn't need Jerry's one minute. Uh, I am done. This is just uh, ways that you can get involved. So coming to events like this tonight, um, we will have future workshops uh, coming up at different stages in the, in the effort. We also have a photo contest that technically ended on January 31st. But if you do have any photos, we will still accept them. If you want to submit them to that. There's no cash prizes. I'm sorry. Um, but, but you will get fame. Maybe not the fortune part, but you will get fame. So. Uh, check out the website. There's a lot of information there, a lot more than I can provide in five minutes. Um, and you can also find out about that photo contest. And if you could get us photos in the next week or so, we will still accept them. So thank you. I'll turn it back over to Jerry. Before we break out to our tables, one last round of applause for our speakers. When you walked in the door tonight, you should have received a card looking like this. Um, in the corner of it, there should be a number. Uh, that number indicates the number of the table you're supposed to go to. Uh, please follow that um, as quick as you possibly can right now because we're running a couple minutes behind. Head to the table. Thank you again for being here. Uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Great job. Pencils down, test is over. We're gonna start, uh, I'll start over in this corner of the room. You can stay right where you are and we'll have the facilitators report out. Um, we had a great group. What was most important and the themes that emerged were number one, accessibility, a multimodal uh, connectivity that brings people and neighborhoods together. Also, uh, light rail, a big part of that. In addition, um, breaking the walls of segregation and racism 
was very uh, was was one of the top concerns that that uh, is an issue we want to uh, address. And then safe bike lanes, yay! Uh, so we we had uh, two things on uh, why what makes Milwaukee a great place to live in, uh, 35 years from now, and the first one was uh, diversity, and the second one was uh, affordability. So those were the two big issues on the land use and transportation side. Uh, by a fairly wide margin multimodal transportation system. And uh, second, the compact development near job centers. And those two things uh, work quite well together. So those were the top two. Um, our group, the top vote getters for why Milwaukee is great, number one and two were um, Lake Michigan, water in general, and access to the water. Um, then uh, arts, culture, entertaining, entertainment, like a thriving metropolis. Um, in terms of what's created to make that happen, um, integrated transportation slash multimodal choices in transportation and light rail. Well, uh, we didn't quite get to the voting part, so my uh, group can meet me out in the parking lot afterward if uh, <laughs> they disagree. But uh, there was a lot of emphasis on water quality and preserving the resources, the abundant resources that Milwaukee has. Um, and then a lot on safety and also kind of combining them here, um, business development, economic development, and how it would grow. And as for transportation, Interconnectivity was big across the board, um, but also regionally to suburbs, to um, uh, Minneapolis, uh, even larger. Um, what would you guys say for maybe a second one? Working together to obtain these goals. So. And breaking down barriers. Thank you. Okay, uh, our results just came in. So uh, for why the uh, Milwaukee region is great, uh, our top reasons were that it is a socioeconomically uh, diverse region all across the region, um, and also that sprawl has been stopped, and we have an agile and efficient public transit system that elegantly fits the cityscape. And we are no longer the most segregated region in the US. And as far as the transportation system to facilitate that, top um, vote getter was that it is an integrated system across the region, uh, no longer a piecemeal system between the different communities and different transportation networks. And that there's a high speed rain that connects, high speed train which connects um, a regional hub stretching from uh, St. Louis to Chicago, Detroit, Milwaukee, and Minnesota and that we have an extensive bike system that includes um, bike commuter support systems and um, inner urban trails. We're group number one. Um, we had some fabulous ideas here and really could have used a little more time to flesh out some of them, but the one that got the most votes was an integrated transit system that would integrate cars, buses, trains, and electric cars with the integrated system. Um, th another one was um, easy day trips to Chicago and Minneapolis uh, with transit to jobs also being a priority. Um, under what are the transportation system and development priorities? Um, the highest votes was rapid unimpeded decision making and implementation. <laughs> and a system that can add equal access to jobs and education. We have some similar things here. Um, looking at 2050, I think a lot of people here agreed that what we want is a well-funded multimodal transit system that is really designed in a holistic manner. So it has all options and it really connects people to all kinds of things, um, whether it's culture or your jobs or entertainment. Um, and that people are really looking for human scale, places built for people, and beautiful places that we really need to understand that beauty does have a role in this. And as far as how we're gonna do that, um, connecting, easily connecting the suburbs and the city would really support our economy. Um, people wanna be able to move easily around the region. Um, and then making our neighborhoods walkable and safe, and really the safe word came up as something that we wanna focus on as far as that idea of places built for people. 
uh, as a number one priority um, if they can move around walking or on their bike or on transit safely. Thank you. Uh, our themes are very similar to what have already been, dis the, all the things that have already been discussed. Uh, places for people, I guess, is a good theme. <clears throat> uh, one thing that uh, our alderman friend from West Dallas brought up and everyone subscribed to is living local. Uh, food, library, schools, jobs, everything all together. Uh, the idea of racial and ethnic diversity and elimination of segregation came up, a dynamic economy. We had a lot of different ideas that kind of attracted attention. It's, for the second topic, uh, the thing that was a very strong uh, point was more focus on multimodal transportation in all its forms. One thought that was added was that no one's talked about the airport. The airport has to be fully integrated into the system, which includes bikes, pedestrians, light rail, buses, everything. Everything's got to work together. Um, and again, on this, uh, mixed use uh, living in all its forms so that people can live, work, and play in a densely populated uh, area with, without sprawl. And we're all going to be happy together. We're not going to fight between Milwaukee and Waukesha and the inner city and the suburbs. Thank you. We're group uh, number four. Uh, question one was our vision. Uh, the number one priority or the number one uh, choice was uh, transit connects people with jobs. Number two was lots of green space with connecting trails. And number three was a regional approach to multimodal transportation. For question two, uh, number one was uh, mixed use developments so daily needs are walkable. Uh, that's a play on words there. Number two was uh, realistic, dedicated funding for all types of transportation. And we had uh, three tied for three. Our group number five, what makes Milwaukee great in 2050? Number one was bicycle and pedestrian paths everywhere, separated from traffic, an emphasis on that. Secondly, there was a tie. One was we figured out how to build compact, walkable communities. And the second one is we have great neighborhoods and a great day downtown that makes 22-year-old college grads want to come live here. Uh, then how do we make this happen? Uh, we have uh, the top one is paved and dedicated walk and bike systems across the city and dedicated funding source for transit, a regional, trans regional transit authority. We were group number six, and I will be short and sweet. Uh, what we thought would make Milwaukee a great place in 2050, we prioritize a lower cost of living, as well as Milwaukee being uh, getting back to being a big city with a small feel. How do we make that happen in terms of transportation? We chose having a variety of transportation, which kind of repeats what everybody else was saying earlier. And the second that we um, picked was making Milwaukee dense, filling the city instead of building outside of it. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. We're gonna turn it over to our speakers for one last quick takeaway from the night, and then we'll say our goodbyes. Um, well, I like what our group talked about in terms of uh, the, the trying to support a lot more mixed use walkable communities. When I think of Milwaukee and some of the places that I think people really think are dynamic places, whether it's the east side around North Avenue or Brady Street or Third Ward, it's because they're very walkable. And if you think about just using the lens of the inner city being extremely valuable, you're gonna want those same things. So it looks like there's a lot of people here that really wanna to work towards this, so let's take action, let's, let's make it happen. I ask us to please not argue what's the leading edge issue to work on. I've been in meetings like this where we've asked, what should housing do? In another meeting, it says, well, how do we make this the healthiest city? And another meeting that says, well, what about making a safe city? Transportation can be the weave through, because if you can't get from here to there, then what's the point? I, as a health person, and as a public health person, ask you to 
think about what are the consequences, intended and not, on the health and vitality of people because of the choices and decisions that we make. Third point, last. Whatever we design better be good for the old and the young, the sick and the well, the wealthy and the not. It is an equalizer. And imagine especially that any person with disability should have as much ability to maximize this great city as those of us who are more ably set. Tough act to follow, but I will try. Um, I guess I would just make a point. Um, coming to events like this and giving us your feedback is a great way to get involved. We also will have uh, many opportunities throughout the Vision 2050 process between now and next June. So please get involved. Um, it's very important to, to hear what you have to say. And for, for that final plan that we developed to have uh, buy-in from people like you and, and also uh, for your support for certain recommendations to be demonstrated with local elected officials, uh, state government, federal government, so that they hear what, what we as a region want uh, for our transportation system and for, our, for how our land is developed. So please get involved, check out the website, uh, follow us on Twitter, um, go write the guiding statements that we have. You should have copies on your table. Uh, submit us your photos and just uh, try to stay involved in our effort and we will try to, try to keep you involved and keep you interested. So, thank you. I, I guess uh, my takeaway is that um, and it's great having a Milwaukee alderman at the table and the city administrator from Wauwatosa at the table um, uh, to liven up the conversation here. But the, the takeaway with transportation for me is that um, Milwaukee as a region, and this is kind of about a regional discussion tonight of how do we succeed, Milwaukee, or Milwaukee metropolitan area as a region succeeds if we all cooperate. And if there's, if there's one uh, agenda to cooperate on, it's transportation. Uh, you, you're reading all these things about the public policy forums, studies of the disconnectedness of jobs and, uh, and people that need jobs. You heard that this evening. Um, and if, if there's one thing that we need to do to compete, because we are competing with every other city nationally and internationally, it's that we need to cooperate. And all of this divisiveness that we hear week in and week out, as a community, as a metro area, we just need to shelve that. Um, and transportation is a great topic and strategy around which to shelve that because everybody will benefit. Suburban businesses will benefit, city residents will benefit. And so the, the one major takeaway that I take tonight, um, and, and as shown by all of the public officials that are here from all these suburban communities, we have mayors here, we have city uh, council members here, administrators, is that everybody cares about transportation. So instead of it being a divisive issue, it'd be tremendous if there was a way to make it into a co uh, an issue that creates cohesiveness in our region so that we can compete effectively as a region. Thank you. Uh, but there are many ways to stay involved in the process, as Eric hinted at. There's the Vision 2050 website. Uh, again, promoting MetroGo, follow us on Facebook. Uh, sign up for email notifications from Vision 2050. Reach out, tell your friends, talk to your local elected officials, not just the ones that are in the room tonight, not just the ones that agree with you. Um, we can be about in this space until about 20 after, and I look at my phone, we got about five minutes then. So uh, uh, in no particular order, I'd like to thank uh, everyone who made tonight possible, our esteemed speakers, our host, Manpower, uh, METC for video production. You'll be able to watch the show uh, next week, I believe, in case you really want to see this again. Uh, refreshment sponsor, HNTB, printing and facilitation design sponsor, URS, um, our volunteer facilitators, our co-sponsors, uh, those that serve on the Metro Growth Steering Committee with me, and most importantly, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, round of applause to yourself and stay involved in the process as it moves forward. College Place is a video library of noteworthy presentations, panel discussions, and lectures featuring guest speakers and faculty members taped at one of the Milwaukee Area Technical College's four southeastern Wisconsin campuses. These are produced by students in the college's associate's degree program in television video production in coordination with Milwaukee Public Television.